the uh, 39th Annual Workshop in Geometric Topology. I'll uh, remind you that we have our principal speaker, uh, Jessica Purcell, giving a talk later this afternoon, uh, four to five. And the way we're working it to, to accommodate her schedule in Australia is that we're doing the contributed talks first. And so we'll just get going. This is uh, uh, session three. Remember, there are two other sessions going. You can find the schedule uh, at the workshop webpage. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, uh, first speaker this afternoon uh, in our session three, and that's Mark Hughes of BYU. And since you can all see the title right in front of you, I will let you and uh, Mark take care of the title of the talk. Uh, take it away, Mark. All right, thank you. Um, well, and a thank you to the organizers um, for, for letting me speak. Also, um, for letting me speak first, I like I like to be able to just enjoy the rest of the conference after my talk is over. So it's it's nice to get this out of the way and, and be able to go first. So um, so I'm going to talk a, a bit about branch coverings and broken left shuts vibrations on non compact four manifolds. Um, and if you don't know all those words, that's fine. Um, I'll I'll describe them at least in, in some some loose terms here. Um, Oops. So the, the first thing is, is sort of the, the, the idea or the motivating idea of this talk is that when, when you're studying four dimensional manifolds, a lot of times any of the descriptive techniques that you want to use really are, are most well developed for compact four manifolds. Um, so for example, uh, you have what are called handle decompositions of manifolds and those give you Kirby diagrams, which are a really sort of hands-on descriptive way to work with four manifolds. Um, you can represent a four manifold via a branch covering representation. And what that does is, is you take your four manifold, you come up with a branch covering over some simpler four manifold that you understand well, typically S4 or B4. And then the branch covering map can kind of be represented or, or described by some, some surface that you have embedded or at least immersed inside your simple four manifold. That's your branch locus. And that sort of gives you a, a descriptive way to describe your manifold. There are also things called trisections, which give you trisection diagrams, where you cut up your four manifold into three pieces. Um, and then there are also things like left shifts vibrations, where you, you come up with a vibration on your manifold from your four manifold to some, some surface. And by understanding the monodromy of this, of this function or of this map, you can represent your four manifold. Now, these have all been sort of well studied. Um, some of them are newer than others. Um, but uh, a lot of the times that they really only are sort of worked out for sort of the non -com or the compact case. And, and so the goal of this talk is to sort of uh, adapt these techniques to some non compact four manifolds. Um, and the ones I'm going to focus on are, are branch covering representations and broken left shifts vibrations. And the example or the sort of the family of examples that I'll obtain will be sort of representations of small exotic R4. So these are, I'll say more about these in a bit, but these are sort of Manif four dimensional manifolds that are homeomorphic to R4, but are not diffeomorphic to R4. Okay? And, and four dimensions is the only, of course, situation or dimension where these types of things happen or where you have exotic RNs. So um, to describe what a broken left shift vibration is, let's let W be a smooth four manifold and let sigma be a surface. And I'm going to assume throughout the talk that everything is orientable. Um, if if F is a smooth function from, from W to sigma um, with sort of compatible boundaries, then we, call, we, we say a left shift's critical point is a critical point about which you can, of your function about which you can find complex coordinates that are sort of just described in this local form, okay? So it's, it's sort of a critical point where locally the map can be mod modeled by this, okay? Now, um, to sort of understand what these are telling you, if you, if you if if sort of this is your sigma here, this is your surface, um, then uh, at any regular point of your function, the preimage is going to be a two dimensional because you've got a map from from a four dimensional thing to a two dimensional thing. At any regular point, uh, the preimage is just going to be a surface, something two dimensional. OK, and so the regular fibers of this map are just going to be surfaces. Um, and as you approach a left shift's critical point, um, what happens is, is you'll see a, a, a loop on your, on your fiber. And as you look at the fibers, as you get closer and closer to this critical point, what's gonna happen is this, this loop here is gonna shrink down and eventually it's gonna turn into a pair of transverse, uh, a, double, a transverse double point, I should say, okay? 
So this is what's called the left shift's critical point. There's also called an indefinite fold singularity, or sometimes they'll call these round, or they, they'll call these round uh, critical points or things. Just, they have various names, but these are critical points that have sort of a slightly different model, local model. And the image of these critical points is going to be a, a circle in your the base of your fibration. And what happens as you look at the fibers, if for example, you start outside the circle and move inside the circle, what's gonna happen is, is you're, you're gonna have a, a loop inside your fiber that shrinks down and eventually gets canceled. It's, it's like a, a surgery on, uh, on a one handle or something like that. So, um, or I guess, yeah, it's a zero surgery on your, on your fibers, what happens. So your, your, fiber, um, your fiber loses genus here, okay? Oh, and feel, feel free to stop me if you have any questions or anything as we go along, of course. Um, so these are the two kinds of critical points that we're most interested in. Um, if, if your function only has left shifts uh, critical points, then we call it a left shifts vibration. If it has broken or indefinite fold singularities, then, then we call it a, a broken left shifts vibration. And typically when people talk about left shifts vibrations, they require that there's sort of some compatibility in your local charts. Um, and, and so sometimes you'll call it an achiral left shifts vibration if you don't require that orientation condition in your local charts. But I won't really make a big, uh, I mean, there's ways to kind of take something that's non-orientable and sort of fix it into something that's broken plus something that's orientable. So there's kind of ways around the orientation issue. But um, left shifts vibrations are important because of a theorem, actually a pair of theorems by Donaldson and Gomp who proved that a, a smooth oriented closed four manifold admits a symplectic structure if and only if it emits a positive left shift's pencil. So left shift's pencil for, for our purposes here, you can think of that as something that you blow up to give you a left shift's vibration. And so essentially having a symplectic structure is, is sort of equivalent to having a left shift, a, a, having a symplectic structure is equivalent to having a left shift's vibration in some sense. Um, a, a trio of theorems uh, when, and so that previous, theorem by Donaldson and Gomp sort of really only worried, worried about positive left shift vibrations. They didn't take into account broken singularities. Um, but but Akbalut, Karakert, Baker, and Lakili proved independently that every smooth four manifold admits a broken left shift vibration. So um, broken left shift vibrations are a lot more common than, than just ordinary left shift vibrations, as you might expect. There's more, more flexibility with the uh, with the with the singulars, with those broken singularities there. Um, all right, so there's a sort of a number of different constructions and, and I don't know that I'll necessarily take the time to talk too much about these, um, but, but the, the constructions that were used in these theorems that I cited sort of fall into two camps. Um, but, but what's more, I think, interesting or, or maybe more relevant to talk about here is, is sort of what do you get when you have a left shift's vibration or a broken left shift's vibration? And what, what you obtain by that is once you have a vibration picked on your four manifold or chosen, what you can do is um, pick, pick some point in your the base of your vibration, a regular point of your vibration. And when you look in the four manifold, there's gonna be some fiber corresponding to the, to the pre-image of that point, okay? Now, if you start off at this, at this base fiber here, and you travel around loops in your in your um, base space, um, as you as you travel around a loop that passes around a singular um, a, a singular point, a singular value, I should say, what's going to happen is there's going to be a corresponding loop in your fiber, and as you go around that loop in the base, what happens is, is your fiber gets gets sort of changed by your your monodromy is represented by a Dane twist along that loop. Okay, so sort of traveling around any one of these loops is going to correspond to a Dane twist along a corresponding curve in your fiber. And so this gives us a way to actually represent the four manifold completely, um, at least in most cases, by, by, um, by, by just drawing a diagram of your regular fiber and then specifying, um, specifying where the Dane twists are going to take place. So you can just essentially specify what the monodromy of your vibration is. And that gives you a way to represent a four-dimensional object using a surface with some curves drawn on it, okay? That represent the, the, the Dane twists. All right, so 
our, our goal is going to be to sort of build these things on exotic four manifolds on, on exotic R4. So what is an exotic R4? Well, um, this, this theorem here, I have it attributed to Friedman, but it really um, also was, I should cite Donaldson here. Um, um, but they prove uh, using Friedman and, and with work of Donaldson proves that, that there are in, in four dimensions, there are manifolds that are homeomorphic to R4, but not diffeomorphic to R4. And as I mentioned, four dimensions is the only place where you have uh, so-called exotic Rn. In any, other, in any other dimension, if you're homeomorphic to Rn, you're, you're also diffeomorphic to Rn. Now, these, these uh, exotic R4 essentially fall into two camps. There's, there's what's called large exotic R4. And these are kind of the, the, the wild, nasty ones that kind of like are, are really hard to describe. They're, they're, they, they're certainly hard to study. Um, they, they contain compact co-dimensional zero submanifolds that don't sm embed smoothly into any R4. So you, you can't even embed these things into R4. And if you wanted to write down a handle decomposition of your four manifold, you would need infinitely many three handles. So it's, there's, there's sort of some difficulty in, in sort of describing these things. On the other hand, there's these small exotic R4s, which are sort of produced using a different, um, sort of a different line of, 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 a, of attack. These, these manifolds are, are all diffeomorphic to open subsets of R4, and they have nice handle decompositions with, with only zero, one, and two handles. So these ones are a lot more easy to study. They're sort of easier to represent, and they're the ones that we're going to sort of focus on here. And in fact, you can actually get really nice descriptions, really nice pictures of these four manifolds. So Zaka and Gomp um, have this, you know, have a paper where they, you know, or, you know, there's, you can, you can sort of write down these things. And, and if you know what a cast and handle is, you can kind of explicitly see sort of a pair of cast and handles here, um, which sort of gives your manifold the exoticness that you're, that you're after. So, um, so yeah, so the, the, these things here are sort of, um, the, I, I should say, we're going to see some of these diagrams. The way, the way to interpret these diagrams, uh, if, you, if you're not sort of familiar with Kirby diagrams, is um, along each sort of loop, um, you can think of this loop here as specifying a way to attach um, a copy of D2 cross D2, okay? And the way you're going to attach it is you're going to attach it along the boundary of D2, which is an S1, uh, cross a D2. So this, you can think of this as sort of providing instructions on how to glue together a four-dimensional manifold, if you haven't seen these before. Um, and then the dots sort of tell you that you're, you're still going to glue on sort of a D2 cross a D2, but now you're sort of gluing it on using a different, different thing. So, so these are just sort of instructions for representing four manifolds. Um, all right. So if, if we want to sort of build a broken vibration or some kind of vibration on a non-compact four manifolds, um, instead of these nice uh, compact fibers that we were getting uh, in the compact case, uh, here are fibers uh, typically might be uh, non-compact um, orientable surfaces. Okay, and so if you if you haven't sort of thought carefully about non-orientable or sorry, not non-compact, I might have, I think I mixed up some words there. If you if you haven't thought carefully about non-compact surfaces, there there is a nice classification theorem uh, for non-compact surfaces, um, but there it requires a little bit more subtlety than in the compact case where you know in the compact case you really just have to care about the number of boundary components the orientability and the genus um here you have to sort of track what's called the space of ends and so here are just two examples of two surfaces that i've kind of drawn here um in 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 these cases sort of the ends are the are the pieces that go off to infinity um they're the they're sort of the non-compact case the non-compact parts of your of your manifold and so here I've sort of identified some of the ends. Um, some of these ends sort of have genus as you go out to infinity, and some of them do not have genus. So we can kind of specify um, we can kind of specify which ends have genus and which ends don't have genus. Um, and and if you sort of obtain all that information, you you know whether your surface is orientable. You know what what the ends are. There's a there's a natural topology on the space of ends. Um, but once you know sort of the, the genus, the number of boundary components, and you sort of know what this space of ends looks like, you do get a nice classification theorem for non-orientable, or sorry, non-compact surfaces. Um, but there are a lot of them. So if you, if you sort of follow some work of Richards, um, the, if, if you sort of understand sort of how these end spaces are, are constructed and how they're sort of understood, um, you end up, you can see that, that you, you're going to have a lot of different types of, of 
non-compact orientable surfaces. So there's a lot of surfaces like that. And if you wanted to sort of come up with a nice uh, left shift vibration, you might presumably want to have some control over the type of surfaces you obtain as your fibers. Um, and so in, in, in sort of the stuff we do here, I'm, we're able to sort of do this. So here's, here's sort of the long theorem. You can, you can think of this theorem as basically saying, um, given a small exotic R4, we can come up with a broken left shift vibration. Now that's not necessarily a new fact, but um, the way we do it is sort of through uh, branch coverings of, of, of four dimensional manifolds over, over R4. Um, and you, you get sort of um, some nice explicit examples. You also get a lot of control over the fibers that you want. So the fibers you get, um, are all infinite genus orientable surfaces with a single end. So you don't, you'll really only get sort of one type of fiber um, and you can sort of arrange all the singularities in a nice way. So um, in the last sort of four minutes here, I'll just sort of talk about how this is done, um, how we obtain these vibrations on our format, on our exotic R4, and then show you some pictures. So essentially what we do is we use braided surfaces um, and Maybe I'll skip sort of with the discussion of this because I can kind of, I can kind of explain it a little bit in a second here, but but here's essentially how we build our our four manifold our our vibration on our four manifold. Um, oops. Okay. Um, we we follow sort of a, a construction of Loy and Piergolini, and so what we do is is first of all instead of trying to build the vibration directly what we're going to do is try and build a branch covering of our four dimensional manifold over over d4 so what we do is we start off with a handle decomposition of our manifold we build a branch covering of the zero handle over b over d4 and then what we do is we extend our branch covering function over our the rest of our four manifold one handle at a time so every time you add sort of a single uh, every time you, you extend your branch covering over a one handle, you're going to get a disc. Every time you extend your branch covering over a two handle, you're going get, to get a band that's attached to some discs. And what this does is it gives you sort of a branch covering of, of the four manifold you care about over D2 cross D2. Okay. And then here's sort of the schematic. So uh, we, we have our, our four manifold. We can express it as a branch covering over this four, four dimensional ball. The branch locus of this covering is some surface that we have embedded in our ball or immersed in our ball. Actually, sorry, it's, it's embedded in the four ball. I've drawn some immersed points here um, because I'm representing it in three dimensions. But this is the, the branch locus is going to be a surface embedded inside your four ball. What you can do is you can arrange this, this surface in some nice way um, so that it, it sort of sits nice with respect to the projection map onto D2. And once you've arranged your surface in this nice way, now what happens is if you take a point and you look at the pre-image of that point under this projection, it's just gonna be a single disc. And if you look at the pre-image of that disc over under the branch covering map, that's gonna be a nice fiber. And so the composition of these two functions is gonna be a, a, a left shuts vibration. So uh, essentially we, we perform this procedure using exotic R4s where we build a branch covering uh, of our exotic R4 over R2 cross R2 now. So we want something non-compact in the base. And, um, but the problem is because these things have infinite uh, handle decompositions, handle decompositions with infinitely many handles, uh, we can't do it all at once. So what we do is we sort of take some uh, nested sequences of, of D2 cross, compact D2 cross D2s that sort of fill up our manifold and we sort of do it one piece at a time. So we'll build our branch covering over sort of some compact piece and then we'll extend it over some other compact piece, et cetera. And then um, what we do is, is we do the, then once we've built our branch covering and we have our branch locus, we can do the same thing by braiding, um, sort of working our way out to braid our, to braid our branch locus. And, and so we need sort of an extra theorem to do this about sort of braiding over cobordisms, but fortunately you can, you can prove that this works. Um, and at the end of the day, you're able to get some, some branch covering, you're able to build a, a broken left shift vibration of your exotic R4. So here's sort of an example of what this looks like in practice. We start off with a nice handle decomposition. Uh, there's a symmetrization that, ha that, that you can do. Um, it's kind of hard in practice to find this, but it always exists. Um, so you have to symmetrize your, your handles. 
once you've symmetrized your handles, you can sort of construct the branch look, branch covering sort of explicitly. Um, and once you've done that, then you can sort of write down your monodromy representation of your of your uh, exotic R4. So I think I'm about out of time. So I think I will uh, stop there. I guess I'll just add one question um, just about sort of in what sense are these representations unique? Um, you know, are there sort of there, there are some local moves by which you can sort of pass from one monodromy representation of a four manifold to another, but are there sort of more global things that can happen? So I'll stop there. Thank you. All right, thanks, Mark. Uh, we do have time for some questions. So if you have one, just uh, unmute yourself and just jump right in. I had a couple of questions. Sure. Um, Let's see, why, uh, what, what's the advantage of starting with an exotic R4? What, what were you getting out of that? Um, well, so, I mean, as opposed to, to just an ordinary R4? Yeah. Well, I mean, an ordinary R4 is just easy to describe. So we're, we're trying to develop descriptive, I'm trying to kind of think about descriptive tools. And uh -huh. so, so there's nothing, I mean, in terms of, in terms of sort of four-dimensional manifolds, there's no, uh, you're not gaining anything, but it's it's allowing us to sort of describe a more interesting class of manifolds is all. I mean, I, we, we could have done this with ordinary R4, and but it's just kind of a, a little bit more boring, I think, so. And, and the second question was, you in the beginning, you mentioned different ways of describing four manifolds. Is there some translation of your approach to like curvy diagrams or, or some other? Approach? Yeah, so, so yeah, so you can, for example, if you have a if you have a, a left shift vibration and you know the monodromy representation, you can build up a handle decomposition so you can get a Kirby diagram, uh -huh. and from a Kirby diagram you can come up with a trisection diagram. Uh, it, you know, there's there's ways to sort of pass in between each of these representations. So, okay, thanks. Yep, thank you. Other questions? Go ahead if you've got them. Okay, well, if not, uh, let's go ahead and, and let's thank Mark one more time.